Thank you, Hannah, for that very generous introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here um, and to experience a little bit this lively community in um, medieval studies. Um, Pygmalion's, um, in Ovid's Pygmalion story, a beloved ivory statue miraculously comes to life in response to its creator's desire. As recounted in Book 10 of the Metamorphoses, the renowned sculptor Pygmalion carves a lifelike image of a woman in ivory. She's more beautiful than any woman he's ever seen, and he falls in love with his creation. However, the ivory woman does not respond to the sculptor's many declarations of his devotion. So Pygmalion goes to praise to Venus that she bring the statue to life, and Venus complies. The ivory statue is then transformed into an ivory white woman. Marriage and the birth of a son follow, and the miraculous enlivening of the ivory statue transforms the sculptor's passion for an inanimate thing into marriage with a living woman and heterosexual reproduction. The stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses insist on transformation. A woman becomes a bear, a man becomes a stag, a boy turns into a flower, a girl into a fountain. And Ovid frequently insists on the human awareness that persists in the changed form. The account of Pygmalion's transformed statue is one of the rare metamorphosis stories in which a thing becomes a human being. And I think that this story in particular invites our attention to the material that is transformed. That is, the story insists on materiality in a way that not only points to the miraculous animation of inanimate matter into life, but also draws our attention to the qualities of the ivory material that Pygmalion carves to make his statue, and it calls our attention to the work of the sculptor. Ovid's metamorphoses seem to have been of great interest to medieval authors who translate Ovid's stories and moralize them. They interpret the stories as allegories of Christian truth. Medieval translations of Pygmalion's story, moralizing translations and translations that adapt and amplify the story, these medieval translations follow Ovid in dwelling on the qualities of ivory itself, the way it feels, the way it looks, and above all, its whiteness. The ivory-white complexion of the statue transformed into a living lady, this ivory whiteness so lavishly praised in the medieval translations of Ovid's story is revealed to be not a natural feature but a constructed quality as borrowed from a material substance and shaped by a sculptor's craft. <coughs> I'm going to explore the materiality of ivory in several medieval translations of Ovid's story. My earliest example is in the 13th century romance of the Rose where Jean de Main includes Pygmalion's story at the very end of the romance. I'll, then discuss, I'll also discuss ver the version of the story recounted in the 14th century text now known as the Ovid Moralisé, or the Moralized Ovid, so called because the translator has added moralizing interpretations to the Ovidian story. The Ovid Moralisé is the first, full tr complete, the first complete translation of the Metamorphoses into French, and its version of the Pygmalion story follows Ovid's Latin pretty closely, but the translator has extended or modified some passages and may have been influenced by the version of the story in the Romance of the Rose. I'll also briefly consider another 14th century translation of the Pygmalion story in Gower's Confessio Amantis. I'll begin by describing the qualities of ivory and then move to an exploration of animation and liveliness in the story. I'll insist on the values of whiteness suggested in the transformation of the carved ivory statue into an ivory white woman. And I'll, as I conclude, I'll return to the animal bodies that provide the material for Pygmalion's ivory statue and for the reproductions of his story. Uh, so, part one, elephant ivory. The story of Pygmalion's ivory statue seems to have received particular attention in 13th and 14th century Europe, a period in which the amount of ivory imported into northern Europe saw a significant increase 
due to the opening of new trade routes from West Africa by Genoese merchants. In other words, as the circulation of ivory increased, so did the circulation of Pygmalion's story. And this coincidence draws attention to the material that the sculptor so lovingly fashions into a beautiful woman. Ovid's story specifies that Pygmalion's statue is carved from snow-white ivory, and most medieval translations and adaptations preserve ivory as the sculptor's medium. In the Romance of the Rose, Jean Demain describes Pygmalion's ivory statue. The Ovid Moralisé identifies white ivory, ivoire blanc, and Gower also specifies ivory when he includes the Pygmalion story in the Confessio Amantis. Ivory may be a particularly appropriate medium for Pygmalion's lifelike statue because the texture and quality, uh, the texture and tactility of ivory evoke skin in ways that stone does not. As Sarah Guérin has emphasized, the texture and polish of ivory reproduce the reflective qualities of skin. And ivory not only looks like skin, but the fine, smooth, and slightly viscous grain of ivory feels like skin. We might speculate that these qualities explain the Pygmalion story's repeated emphasis on the scholar's desiring touch. Well before the rigid statue miraculously softens with life, Pygmalion seeks to feel the ivory as flesh. Ovid explains that Pygmalion, quote, grasps the statue and seems to feel his fingers sink into the limbs when he touches them, and then he fears lest he leave marks of bruises on them. The translation in the Romance of the Rose um, also describes the soft yielding of the statue that Pygmalion imagines, but in terms that recall the indistinct boundary between touching and feeling. The narrator describes the press of Pygmalion's touch. He touches her softly with his hands and believes that the flesh yields like dough beneath the pressure, but it is his own hand that yields as it presses. Pygmalion's perception of the responsiveness of his, statu of his statue's hard flesh is mistaken, the text explains. He takes his own yielding flesh for the statue's yielding surface. And yet, even if ivory is not soft and yielding, it may nonetheless be responsive to touch. The collagen remaining in harvested ivory holds a temperature similar to that of living flesh. Ivory takes the heat of the living hands that hold it, and it holds the heat of that touch. When Pygmalion caresses the statue and thinks he feels flesh, he may not be quite as delusional as the Romance of the Rose narrator would have it. The ivory of his statue may indeed respond to the warmth of his touch. The strange liveliness of ivory recalls that it was once part of a living elephant's tusk. Though we don't know how closely medieval people would have associated the material with elephants. Ivory could also come from I walrus or narwhal, so it's possible that in medieval France, ivory was just known to come from far away and perhaps from far away animals. Some carved ivory recalls um, its origin in its shape, as does this olifant, and readers could have seen somewhat approximate representations of elephants with tusks in medieval bestiaries. Realistic representation is not necessarily the goal of the bestiaries which are interested in the allegorical meaning, the allegorical meanings of animal physiology and behavior, but almost all bestiary illuminations of elephants include the tusks. We find a more accurate representation in Matthew Paris's painting of the elephant given to Henry III of England by Louis IX of France in 1255. This is an image drawn from life, and I believe you have the chance to hear more about Matthew Paris's life drawing next week from Robert Mills. Here, the elephant's tusks may not have thought much about the origin of these luxury items, even if they knew they were made from an elephant's tusk. Although we have to wonder if this particular panel offers a self-referential joke in its representation of an elephant on an ivory box. We don't know how many people would have gotten the joke, 
Some users may have thought of ivory as a kind of stone or as a kind of bone or maybe an elephant bone. In his 13th century bestiaire divin, Guillaume Leclerc identifies the source of ivory as elephant bones, not, not elephant tusk. Whether or not its origins were well known, luxury was a, um, luxur uh, ivory was a luxury good much prized in medieval Europe, and sculptors would certainly have known what they were carving. Here's a rare representation of an ivory worker found in an 11th century Byzantine manuscript. According to Avinoam Shalem, this craftsman is probably working to remove the damaged husk from the elephant tusk to get to the carving material inside. But when we come to visual representations of Pygmalion the sculptor, ivory largely disappears as illuminators focus on craft. Pygmalion is usually, seen, usually seems to be carving a stone, perhaps marble or alabaster. In this 14th century illumination from a Romance of the Rose manuscript, we see the elaborately dressed Pygmalion at work in a rather awkward pose. A carved capital in the bottom left corner of the illumination testifies to the sculptor's craft, and another block on the right seems to await final shaping. The carved woman extends a hand in an expression of movement, but her recumbent position and closed eyes suggest that she waits to be awakened or enlivened by the sculptor's craft. And the Romance of the Rose insists on Pygmalion's skill, adding to Ovid's account an enumeration of the materials the sculptor carves. The romance introduces him as Pygmalion, a sculptor who demonstrated his great talent by carving figures in wood, in different stones, in metals, in bone, in wax, and all the other material, toutes autres matières, all the other matter, materials one could find at the time. Then the narrator explains that in order to test his skill and to enhance his reputation, Pygmalion decides to carve a statue from ivory. And this image of a woman was so realistically portrayed that she seemed as alive as the most livi beautiful living creature. Elle semblait être autre si vive comme la plus belle rien qui vive. The text follows the Latin original here, specifying that uh, Ovid too tells us that the statues seem to be alive. But the Romance of the Rose goes further, specifying that never did Helen or Lavinia have such delicate color or such harmonious form. Nunca Hélène ni Lavine ne furent de couleur si fine. The narrator does not tell us that Pygmalion painted his statue, though medieval ivory statues were often painted. This um, miniature represents Pygmalion with a pot and a brush, um, so at least one illuminator thought the sculptor was also a fellow painter. But all the medieval Pygmalion stories record the sculptor's praise for the ivory-white complexion of his beloved woman, suggesting that the statue's extraordinarily delicate color, like her surprising liveliness, are, are, is a quality of the material from which she is sculpted. Um, animating desire. Pygmalion is astonished by his creature creation, the Romance of the Rose explains, he is surprised by love for his lifelike statue. And his desire for the ivory woman is described as a desire for response. That is, he wants to see his statue animated with a response to his own passion. This is a highly gendered dynamic in which the man is the active desirer and the lady the passive desired object here literally an object, and in all versions of the story it's clear that Pygmalion's desire drives the story and ultimately motivates the enlivening of the statue. On the one hand, this is entirely logical since Pygmalion is a living man and his statue an inanimate thing. But on the other hand, the story's insistence on response defines animation as a response to desire. Only a response to the sculptor's request for love can animate the ivory statue, and animation can only signify a response to love. What animation is and means seems both circular and restricted here. <coughs> 
I already described Pygmalion's touch on the statue, the desiring caress that seeks to feel her flesh yield in response to his touch. But this is not the only way in which the sculptor seeks to obtain a response from his beloved lady. The Romance of the Rose and the Ovid Moradizi elaborate Ovid's account of Pygmalion's desire for the statue to return his love. And as they describe Pygmalion's touch on the ivory, his caresses, his loving care in dressing the statue, his embrace of the ivory woman in dance, these narratives insist on the statue's failure to respond. Its inanimate nature stressed in repeated descriptions of its inability to move in response to the sculptor's entreaties. Ovid records that Pygmalion's masterwork fired him with desire. It seemed to be alive, its face to be a real girl's, a girl who wished to move but modesty forbade. The French versions of the story focus not so much on the statue's purported modesty as on its inability to respond. In the Romance of the Rose, Pygmalion laments his statue's lack of physical and linguistic mobility. I love a deaf and mute statue that cannot move at all, Pygmalion laments. J'aime une image sourde et mûre qui ne se crawl ni ne mûre. The couplet rhymes the homonyms mûre and mûre, uh, mute and move, and the rhyme emphasizes Pygmalion's perception of his statue's inanimacy. It cannot speak and it cannot move. The Remnants of the Rose records at length Pygmalion's efforts to gain a response from his unmoving statue. He offers the ivory woman a love token, reproaches her when she does not accept it, and then begs her to forgive his harsh words. He plays music for the statue, dresses it in many different kinds of clothing, and tries to dance with it. Jean de Main describes at length the clothes and jewels that Pygmalion puts on his statue and the many instruments he plays for his beloved lady. And I want particularly to stress the clothing. We learn that the sculptor dresses and redresses the statue in beautiful clothes made from luxury fabrics. Here's the Romance of the Rose. Then he dresses her in many different kinds of intricately styled clothes made from beautiful soft wool, precious and well-crafted in bright and clear colors of green, blue, and brown and adorned with luxurious feathers and the furs of ermine and squirrel. Then he takes them off to see how she looks in dresses of silk taffeta, chiffon, moiré, in blue, vermilion, yellow, and brown. He dresses her in twills, brocades, and camlets. Pygmalion also covers his beloved statue's head with a veil, but he does not cover her face, the narrator tells us, because, quote, he does not want to follow the custom of Saracens, who are so full of jealous passion that they cover their women's faces when they go into the street so that none will see them. The reference to Muslim veiling practices may be motivated by the provenance of the luxurious fabrics in which Pygmalion dresses his statue, which includes silks imported from the Middle East and Asia. The story implicitly references a transnational trade in fabrics, but it recognizes and even celebrates the commerce in material goods while restricting the import of cultural customs. The beautiful clothes Pygmalion chooses for his love ivory lady situate her in a global network of trade in luxury goods, but it appears that value is defined as much by what you keep out as by what you import. The narrator is careful to distinguish this Western beauty from a Muslim woman. The statue's rich clothes enhance her feminine attractions instead of hiding them, the narrator claims. Pygmalion dances with the beautiful statue he has so beautifully dressed, but the text tells us that his heart is heavy, because despite his invitations and his pleading, she does not want to sing or respond. In this illumination, we see a representation of the sculptor dressing his statue. He seems to dance beside it. And his fantasies about the statue are no doubt reflected in the sexual imagery suggested by the fashionable accessories at the left of the image. But the ivory woman stands stiffly immobile as he sews her into the clothing. And the narrator emphasizes 
the futility of Pygmalion's passion. Poor delusional Pygmalion, moved by a deaf statue, Pygmalion lui déceut pour sa sourde image émeute. And yet, as this couplet suggests, the text has it both ways. The statue may be incapable of moving in response to Pygmalion's entreaties, but it moves the sculptor to love. So Pygmalion is moved by his own creation. We might say that he creates his own desire. In their extended representations of the sculptor's interactions with the statue he has made, medieval, translators, medieval translations insist on the power of artistic creation to move human emotions, as many critics have observed. But the sculptor's continued interactions with his ivory lady, and particularly his adornment of the statue, call attention to Pygmalion's craft, that is, to the statue's beauty, its lifelike qualities, as produced through the sculptor's skillful shaping of white ivory into an ivory white lady. Um, so here's my third part from Ivory Diamond. The ivory of Pygmalion's statue is an essential feature of the statue's lively beauty, and in all versions of the story, Metamorphosis makes the ivory material of the statue into a quality of the living lady, her ivory white complexion. In Ovid's version, when Pygmalion goes to the Temple of Venus to ask the goddess to vivify his statue, he articulates his request as follows. If you, O oh gods, can give all things, I pray to have a wife. He did not dare add my ivory maid, but said, one like my ivory maid, similis mea aborna. The sculptor does not ask for his statue to be given life, even if that's what he really wants. Instead, he asks for a wife who is like his statue. We understand this as a more modest request, that is, to ask Venus to find him a lover who resembles his statue would seem to be a more reasonable request than to ask Venus to transform a statue into a living woman. But the French translations change the emphasis in Pygmalion's prayer to the goddess. Whereas in Ovid's account, the sculptor does not dare to ask for the vivification of his ivory statue. In the Romance of the Rose, he not only asks Venus to give life and soul to his statue, he himself animates the statue in his request. He says that she has stolen his heart. Here's his prayer to Venus. And so, by your sympathy, sweetness, and benevolence, Grant me that the beauty who has stolen my heart, la belle qui mon cœur humble, give me that, grant me that the beauty who has stolen my heart and who so closely resembles ivory may become my loyal lady, my loyal lover, and that she may have the body, soul, and life of a woman. Pygmalion makes a metaphor of the material of his statue. The woman who has stolen his heart resembles ivory. So whereas in Ovid, the sculptor asks for a woman who resembles his statue, in the Romance of the Rose, he asks for the enlivening of the woman who resembles ivory. Similarly, in the Ovid Moralisé, Pygmalion asks Venus to grant that the young woman who resembles ivory may become my wife. Octroyez que la touze qui semble voir soit m'épouse. But here the translator intervenes to underscore Pygmalion's rhetorical transformation of the material into metaphor. The translator points out that, quote, he does not say that it was made from ivory. Ne dit pas que ce fut ivoire. For even before Venus works her miraculous enlivening of the statue, Pygmalion has rhetorically transformed his ivory creation into a woman who is like ivory. She is ivory white. The statue's beauty is located in its essence, the ivory, even as that essence is made metaphorical through the animating rhetoric of the request, the beauty who has stolen my heart, and then by Venus's transformation. Pygmalion's beautiful living lady is like ivory. She is ivory white. Whiteness is the defining feature of the material in which Pygmalion carves his statue, and ivory whiteness is a defining feature of the living woman she becomes. 
This is not surprising. Appreciation of the beloved lady's pale complexion corresponds to conventional descriptions of beauty found throughout medieval narratives. French texts insist everywhere on the blancheur of lovely ladies and even of noble men. However, such descriptions do not usually call on ivory as an example of perfect paleness. In French, authors would describe skin as white as snow, as white as a lily, as white as the hawthorn flower, l'aubépine, but not as white as ivory. So although ivory may be a frequent designator of whiteness in Ovid's text, it's not a common descriptor for a light, for a light complexion in French. And the move from material to metaphor, from ivory to ivory white complexion, signifies differently in the French translations of Ovid's text. That is, the ivory material of Pygmalion's statue is not a literal representation of a metaphor describing whiteness, at least not a metaphor common in Old French. Let me, by contrast, mention another material representation of a lady's pale face from an earlier medieval French text. In an episode from Chrétien de Troyes' uh, 12th century grail romance, Le Comte du Graal, the knight Percival stands transfixed, mesmerized by the sight of three drops of blood spilled on white snow. The blood and the snow together resemble the fresh color of his beloved lady's face, the text tells us. The vermilion color on the white surface of the lady's face is just, was just like the image created by the three drops of blood on the white snow. I would say that this scene makes literal the metaphorical equivalence of white snow and the lady's pale face found in conventional descriptions of beautiful women who are white as snow. The material, white snow, is a support for a metaphorical equi equivalence. And it may be worth noting that here, too, animal death, or at least animal wounding, <coughs> makes possible the material representation. The blood, on, the blood drops on the snow re that recall the blushing color on the lady's white face, these blood drops were spilled by a goose wounded in flight by a falcon. When translating Pygmalion, the Pygmalion story, medieval clerics follow their source in describing the ivory statue transformed into an ivory white woman. But my point is that the move from material to metaphor is somewhat awkward in French because ivory is not a common comparison for a lady's pale complexion. And I think this is another instance in which the medieval translations call attention to materiality and craft in the Pygmalion story, and more specifically to ivory as a material support for the value associated with whiteness in the story. I mentioned earlier that the increased importation of ivory in the 13th and 14th centuries corresponds to an increased circulation of the Pygmalion story in vernacular texts. And I see this coincidence as an invitation to think seriously about the materiality of the ivory statue. Another contemporary development may also ground an analysis of the whiteness that the story emphasizes in its description of, ivory, of the ivory white complexion of the living lady. Art historian Madeleine Cavanus has called attention to the developing representation of white complexions in visual representations of Western human subjects starting in the mid-13th century. Prior to this period, artists had represented human skin by applying layers of pigment to depict rich flesh tones, which resulted in pinkish skin with brown or tan undertones. Darker skin pigmentation was represented using black or purple paint or in stained glass, dark blue colors. In the mid-13th century, Cavanus argues, artists began to comp depict complexions as white. Here are two of the images he, she uses to make this point. Both are from medical manuscripts. The illumination on the left from an 11th century commentary represents skin tones with brown and pink undertones. The image on the right depicts white subjects. Cavanus suggests that this shift 
corresponds to the expansion of Western crusading movements. That is, the shift may be motivated by the increasing contact of Western Christians with brown and black people. And that, that it may, she suggests that it may mark a moment when Christian Westerners began to define themselves as white, that is, as phenotypically different from non-Christian others. The use of skin color to denote difference, and particularly religious difference, can be found in medieval literary texts and visual representations from well before the 13th century. A number of scholars have noted the, so, the black so-called Saracen warriors in the Chanson de Roland, uh, or black Muslim knights in Arthurian romances. Geraldine Hang has recently insisted on the reach of racialized representations from the African phenotype that characterizes the executioners of John the Baptist um, on the tympanum of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Rouen, to the many representations of black devils and demons in manuscript illuminations. Heng also emphasizes cavernous study of visual representations that suggests not just how Western medieval people racialized others, but that their own notion of themselves as white is also a construction, a self-image defined in opposition to others and articulated, at least in part, through images. Kavanagh is suggesting, as others have, that racializing discourses are about the self as much as about the other. But she is pointing to material techniques, to craft, to the use of pigments in paint, to represent pigments in skin, to underscore a shift in how Western Christians represented themselves. And I find Kavanagh's essay provocative for the way it points to the materiality of the representation of whiteness, the paint that whitens skin and the uncolored glass that gives white faces luminous clarity, but also, we might add, the ivory that lends ivory white paleness to the beautiful living woman. In the Pygmalion story, though, ivory whiteness is not just a feature of beauty, like the flowing blonde tresses or the appealing form that the poets describe, also describe. In the metamorphosis of the ivory statue into an ivory white woman, white complexion converges with animation as ivory is enlivened into ivory whiteness. I think that in translations of the Pygmalion story produced in the 13th century, a period of increased importation of ivory into Europe and a period in which Christians began insistently to represent themselves visually as white, I think that in the translations of the Pygmalion story produced in the 13th and also the 14th centuries, we see not just a move from material to metaphor, from an ivory statue to an ivory white living woman, but also an essentialization of whiteness. Whiteness is described as a quality of life itself. Here's an illumination that makes this point. It's from the Morgan Library copy of Gower's Confessio Amantis. We see Pygmalion at left embracing his statue. The statue appears to be carved from wood or perhaps cast in bronze, but not made from ivory, even though Gower specifically describes an ivory statue. At right, Pygmalion lies in bed with the woman that the statue becomes. And in the middle, we see a naked woman, white like the woman in the bed, in a pose that echoes the position of the statue at left. The mid this middle figure appears to represent the moment of animation. It is poised in the moment of transformation from immobile statue to animated flesh. Here, metamorphosis whitens as it enlivens. This illumination decouples material, the statue made from ivory, and metaphor, the lady white as ivory. It associates ivory whiteness not with the immobile, unliving statue, but with the living woman, underscoring the symbolic association of whiteness with animation, responsiveness, desirability, and perhaps reproduction. The white figure in the middle of the image looks on the couple posed in an apparently 
post-coital slumber, though their postures, particularly in contrast to Pygmalion's passionate embrace of the dark statue at left, their postures suggest that the sculptor's desire for an inanimate thing has been disciplined into a properly reproductive sexuality. In this illumination, the sculptor's embrace of an inanimate dark thing at left is rewritten as a proper sexual union with a beautifully white and whitened woman. But it also posits the coincidence of whiteness and life itself. The dark statue is whitened as it is enlivened. When Ovid's Metamorphoses are translated in the 14th century Ovid Moralisé, the translator adds moralizing and allegorizing um, interpretations to each story. We find, first, a humorist interpretation that is an explanation of the historical event that could have inspired the fable, or fable, as the translator consistently calls Ovid's stories. Then the translator interprets the story as a Christian allegory, explaining how the pagan fable can recount Christian truth. And as I move toward my conclusion, I'm going to briefly discuss the interpretations that the moralizing translator gives the Pygmalion story in the Ovid Moralisé. In the historical interpretation, the Ovid Moralisé neglects whiteness entirely, but retains a focus on making. The translator identifies a possible origin for the Pygmalion story, explaining that some rich man could have had an impoverished servant girl in his household. This girl was beautiful, but not very smart. He, he continues, she was as stupid as a statue. Such a community image. We learn that this rich man, the historical avatar of Pygmalion, dressed and nurtured the beautiful but not very intelligent girl and taught her until she became wise. So the humorous interpretation is what we would now call a Pygmalion story. It locates the inspiration for Ovid's tale in the actions of a rich man who made a servant girl into the perfect wife. The stony stupidity of the girl inspired the stony substance of Pygmalion's statue, and the animation of the young woman's intelligence was translated into the enlivening of the ivory statue, according to the translator's explanation. This is how the Pygmalion story could be true, he explains. It recounts something that actually happened in the form of a fictional fable. Once the servant girl learned her lessons, the rich man married the young woman he had shaped into a wise wife, and he had a son with her. Again, both ivory and whiteness have fallen out of the historical reading of the Pygmalion story, but craft and making remain. Here, inanimate being, stupid as a statue, is enlivened through the pedagogical making of a perfect wife. In the Hugh Hemmerist interpretation of Ovid's story, the craft of the pedagogue inspires a story about the craft of a sculptor. But Ovid's story can have another meaning, the translator continues, autre sentence il peut avoir. And Ivory re-enters the narrative as he explains how the Pygmalion story may represent Christian truth. The translator's figural reading explains the Pygmalion story as an allegorical representation of the biblical creation story. The sculptor Pygmalion represents the creator God. Both draw human form from unshaped material. Here's the Ovid Moralisé. The creator of the entire world created our human nature in his form and shape through divine wisdom and gave it an ivory form, forme et bourgine. The matter was clay to which God gave human form. The matter was vile and base, which God worked into most excellent form. In the Christian allegory, the whiteness of ivory form, forme et bourgine, makes visible the transformation of base material into God's own form, and it connotes the pure nature of humans before the fall. 
the allegorical interpretation of the sculptor's carving of a lifelike woman as a representation of divine creation does not reference God's creation of Eve from Adam's rib as might be expected, but instead describes a more general creation of all humankind from clay. The description is not degendered, however. Whether by intention or not, the translator uses only feminine nouns to describe God's creation, la forme, la figure, la nature, etc. I think that his insistence on la forme, repeated four times, draws attention to the form of the translator's words as well as to the form of God's creation. The passage thus preserves the gendering of the male creator and his feminine creation found in the Pygmalion story. The allegorical reading of the Pygmalion story as an account of the creation of all mankind does not explicitly exclude non-Christians from divine creation, nor does the translator follow the practice found elsewhere of characterizing non-Christians as black or dark when he translates the metamorphosis of an ivory statue in, of, into an ivory woman as the Christian God's creation of an ivory white human nature. In other words, the moralizing translator makes a claim for the purity of whiteness without contrast to the blackness of what in, would be, in his view, the impure and corrupt pagans, Jews, or Muslims. In both the Pygmalion story and its interpretations, whiteness is linked to life itself. In the metamorphosis of a statue into an ivory white woman and in the transformation of clay material into the ivory form of God's likeness. Both literal and theological texts insist on the extraordinary value of whiteness, on the exclusionary value of whiteness and particularly in relation to Christian salvation, as a number of scholars have shown. In Bruce Holsinger's formulation, the color of salvation is white. But the whiteness of salvation is not merely metaphorical, and Holsinger details the very real violence of, cru of crusader crusading warfare that such rhetoric implicitly articulates and endorses. The Christian allegorical reading of the Pygmalion story in the Ovid Moralisé does not explicitly target non-Christians, though in other interpretations of Ovid's stories in the compilation, the translator does endorse and even advocate violence against Jews and Muslims. Here, however, the translator does not explicitly name non-Christians, whether Jews, Muslims, or pagans, nor does he explicitly exclude them in his praise for the pure white form of God's human creation. Yet the very claim to the value of whiteness can stand as an articulation for this exclusion. In other words, the association of whiteness and life itself is reiterated in exclusionary definitions of human being, of who counts as a human being, in terms of Christian salvation. The point of looking at, at whiteness is not to re reinforce its centrality in medieval discourses about life and salvation, and of course it doesn't need such reinforcement. Rather, the point of interrogating whiteness is to dislodge it from its un often unmarked centrality and authority. And in the context of the Pygmalion story and its interpretations, this means paying attention to the ways in which whiteness moves between material and metaphor in rhetorical tropes, narrative structures, and visual representations to claim a chosen humanity for Western Christian subjects and implicitly to cast all others into the blackness of sin. So again, moraliz moralizations of the Pygmalion story claim whiteness for Western Christian subjects in rhetorical gestures analogous to the painterly techniques underscored by Cavanus in her analysis of visual art. But what the Pygmalion stories bring to this claim is an insistence on making in the Ovid Moralise's interpretation of the Pygmalion story shows, that, shows us that even divine creation requires work. It is craft. It is making. As in, as in the painterly images Cavanus discusses, and like the many manuscripts I've shown you, in Pygmalion stories, whiteness is made. 
we see an example of this emphasis here. The image represents the moment of enlivening, the moment when Pygmalion's ivory white woman speaks to him. And the illuminator has placed this scene in the sculptor's workshop. The human figures stand among tools and partially finished carvings, emphasizing the craft made nature of the ivory woman. Although the sculpted capitals in this image are more likely carved from marble than from ivory, as I've insisted throughout, the text of Pygmalion's story insists on the ivory material of the statue, and I think may implicitly point to the dead animal from which such whiteness is crafted. And as I conclude, I'll turn to one further example of a making of animated whiteness from animal death. Uh, so last section, animal material. In the move that recounts from material to metaphor, from ivory statue to an ivory white woman, the Pygmalion story enlivens an inanimate thing and links, links animation and whiteness. The metamorphosis of an ivory statue into a human being also enlivens a formerly living thing, the elephant whose death produced the ivory. At least one illumination of the Pygmalion story offers a similar though more indirect reminder of the animal material from which Pygmalion shapes his statue. In this image, the artist represents Pygmalion's carving material not as ivory, but as a large block of stone, perhaps marble or alabaster, as I noted earlier. The artist has not colored the stone in this image. The whiteness of the carving material is conveyed by the white surface of the parchment. By contrast, other illuminators use white paint to represent the statue or the statue's face may be lightly tinted, perhaps to reflect the delicate color praised by the narrator of the Romance of the Rose in his comparison of Pygmalion's statue to Helen and Lavinia. But in the unpainted representation of Pygmalion's material reproduced in this illumination, whiteness is a quality of the parchment, the animal skin that is the material support of the manuscript. The image invites a comparison between the animal skin worked to make a white page and the elephant tusk carved into a beautiful white statue. It recalls the slaughter of animals that produces luxury good, and it calls attention to the articulation of cultural values like the lively beauty of whiteness on the bodies of dead animals. Medieval Pygmalion stories call attention to the alignment of, of the material and symbolic commodifications and exclusions that define the ivory statue and that ground the association of liveliness and whiteness. The value of whiteness is not invented by the Pygmalion story. Ovid's Metamorphoses describes beauty in terms of ivory white complexions, and descriptions of noble ladies as white and beautiful are found in the earliest examples of French literature. Similarly, religious literature frequently describes purity in terms of whiteness. Yet if the ubiquity of whiteness as an idealized quality of individuals and groups tends to obscure the privileges it claims and the exclusions it operates, making whiteness seem natural. In medieval translations of the Pygmalion story, the insistence on carved ivory makes visible the work that produces whiteness. In other words, medieval translators insist on the value of whiteness through repeated references to the ivory material of the statue, metaphorically extending that value to encompass feminine beauty, Christian salvation, animacy, animation, and life itself. And all these qualities constitute a claim for the whiteness of the Western Christian subject. Again, in this, the Pygmalion stories align with many other medieval representations. But I'm trying to argue that the medieval translations and moralizations of the Pygmalion story also disrupt the naturalization of Christian whiteness by underscoring the craft that produces the white human form, both in the story of the sculptor Pygmalion and in the interpretation that sees him as a figure of the Creator God.
The Pygmalion story, in its various medieval translations, repeats the characterization of beauty in terms of whiteness, but it also insists that whiteness is work. Whiteness itself is created, and it is crafted through materials produced by an animal's death. Thank you.